thank you so much to Vila for um, giving me the opportunity to share my story today and to um, speak to all of you here today. Um, so um, I play multiple roles, um, as you can see here in uh, my introduction. I am currently a doctoral student at Claremont Graduate University. I do research on undocumented entrepreneurs. I'm about to defend my proposal in two weeks. Um, but I also work um, full time as a research analyst at uh, the Stanford Graduate School of Business uh, with the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. Um, that's my daytime job, my uh, evening time job, weekend job as an immigration advocate. Um, I'm an entrepreneurship ambassador with a nonprofit organization called Educators for Fair Consideration that supports undocumented students. And today I'm going to share a little bit about my um, undocumented story. Um, so today we're going to be hearing from amazing immigrant entrepreneurs. And so um, uh, we thought that it would be really great to sort of give you um, a, a bit of a different perspective in terms of um, how um, immigration, undocumented immigration ties in with entrepreneurship, particularly given our uh, current political landscape. Um, so very briefly, I'll go over my own personal story. I think that um, any immigrant um, really um, has an amazing story to share, and I really encourage all of you to, all of you to get to know um, both um, undocumented, documented immigrants and ask us why we're here. Ask everybody why uh, we all came to this country. Um, so we came here in 1995 from Mexico, um, from near Mexico City. The reason my family made the, the, the difficult choice to come is because there was an economic recession in Mexico at the time. Uh, so my parents were just facing extreme economic hardships. Um, so they made the decision, like um, millions of other individuals, to, to come to this country to, um, for my younger brother and I to have a better life. We settled in the Central Valley in uh, near Modesto, Turlock. And the reason we settled there is because in the 40s, my gra great grandfather was brought through the Bracero program. Um, so because of the war, um, there was a need for agricultural workers from Mexico to come. Um, so it's interesting how immigration policies, you know, bring and take away immigrants whenever it's needed. Um, so we have a, a strong history of, uh, of, um, of us being in the Central Valley and working in the fields. Uh, so my dad came here to work in the fields and sort of were trying to figure out how long they should stay. Um, I've known I was undocumented since I was very young. Uh, my parents stressed the importance of education very early on uh, since we were in Mexico. So I did excelled, did, really, did, did uh, very well in school from uh, third grade when, when I got here. Um, I always enjoyed math. Math was just the one thing I really held on to. I came here as an English language learner and it took me a while to catch up with the language but I knew math, so it was the one thing I could impress my teachers with was that I just um, had always a knack for, for math. So that's really what allowed me um, to, to, to excel in, in elementary, junior high, high school. And um, um, so in this country, there's a Supreme Court uh, a ruling called Plyler versus Doe Do that allows any immigrant, regardless of immigration status, to have access through K-12 education. So anybody can make it through, but it left it up to the states to figure out what to do do with an undocumented immigrant um, once they do make it out of high school. Um, so I graduated from high school in 2005 before the word dreamer, before the word DACA, before all the amazing legislation we now have. Um, I applied to many schools. I was accepted to many schools after getting good grades, all the whole uh, package. Um, but the issue really became the financial issue. So I went through um, the, the, the challenge with uh, as undocumented students to go to college is that we didn't have access to um, financial aid. So I was privately funded um, by um, this McCann Family Honors College at Fresno State, ended up getting a degree in math there, um, moved on um, to pursue graduate school. Again, before, um, before DACA, I made it all the way to uh, my first year as a PhD student at Claremont Graduate University without DACA. Um, and then DACA announcement came out in January uh, of 2012. But um, so after I got my degree, the biggest challenge became to figure out what do undocumented students do after they graduate? Again, before work authorization. So I had a degree in math, a master's in economics, and I couldn't earn a living as an employee without work authorization. This is where it kind of it gets interesting with entrepreneurship and immigration. So in this country, any immigrant, regardless of legal status, can earn a living as an entrepreneur, meaning working as an independent contractor or starting a business. What do you know? So anybody can come to this country, invest, start a business, as long as everybody pays their taxes. So we all get um, either a social security number or an I-10 number, and everybody can pursue entrepreneurship as long as they pay their taxes. So that really sort of started, I started working as an independent contractor with my uh, degree in math, um, and started to sort of think about how does this all tie in, like in terms of um, immigration. 
But anyway, a little bit of a broader context of immigration. Um, there are 11.3 estimated undocumented um, immigrants in this country. So I know the, the, the number you probably are hearing the most right now is the 800,000 DACA recipients, but there are actually about 3.2 million undocumented individuals within my age range. Um, so the, um, the other individuals were not eligible for DACA. Um, I have a few other statistics just to give you an idea of um, there are also many children who are US citizens with undocumented parents. So just to give you an idea that the immigra undocumented immigration context is much larger than what we're, we're, we're currently, uh, currently hearing. Uh, and then in terms of undocumented entrepreneurs, so um, I've done a little bit of research um, in terms of the number of undocumented entrepreneurs who are out there. You're, we'll probably never hear about them. You know, as undocumented individuals, it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of effort for us to come out. Um, particularly, I'm currently a DACA recipient, so I do have relief from deportation, but the majority of individuals are not willing to come out and talk about um, their immigration status or that they're entrepreneurs in the first place. Uh, but it is estimated that about 900,000 undocumented individuals across the country are entrepreneurs. Um, they're in many states um, are actually able to give, they may not be able to get uh, work authorization, but they can hire you as citizens. So just kind of switching the whole idea over of the concept of stealing jobs. Many individuals, individuals are actually creating jobs uh, for, uh, for other folks. It's estimated that about 5% of DACA recipients started a business. Um, a little bit about the organization I work with. I work with an organization that um, disseminates researchers and in information about um, entrepreneurship and immigration, and we also support undocumented entrepreneurs. So we've been thinking about this since about 2012. Um, again, as many undocumented students such as myself started graduating with degrees, I'm about to get a PhD, we needed to think about what can we do um, and what, what are we allowed to do um, in this country. Um, so as you can hear, we're, as you can see here, we have a fund that grants $50,000 to undocumented social entrepreneurs. We, we have many guides and resources. We have a website um, that uh, talks a little bit more in detail about the legal aspects of this concept. Um, we also brought together 50 undocumented entrepreneurs from across the nation last year. We set them up with uh, a business development workshops. We connect, connected them with funders and investors. Y Combinator was there and is actually funding some of our entrepreneurs, which we're really excited about. And we're moving into phase two of really identifying and supporting more um, undocumented entrepreneurs who uh, may be across the country. So I'm here to really deliver a message to get involved and take action. Right now is the most critical time for uh, individuals such as myself. So DACA was rescinded. The program doesn't exist anymore. As of January of 2019, I will not have work permit, means I can no longer work at Stanford University as a researcher. Um, so February 8th, um, the, the uh, a DREAM Act, which is the legislation that could potentially support um, individuals such as myself, will be voted on. So we really need to. Uh, make those phone calls to your representatives because February 8th is the, uh, the deciding day. Important to donate to legal organizations. Um, I'm an undocumented immigrant, but we all should know that there's a Muslim ban. TPS, temporary protection status, will also affect the lives of Salvadorians, of individuals from Haiti. So immigrants are under attack right now. And these organizations um, are really the ones at the forefront challenging policies and really supporting um, um, all immigrants. Um, important to volunteer. Uh, we really need individuals to come out, whether it's translators who can help individuals with their cases, pro bono lawyers, um, uh, anybody in the entrepreneur community who is interested in also mentoring um, individuals is, is great. I'm um, spreading the word about immigrants and refugees' rights. Uh, really, really important to, 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 to really learn about what's going on, really get engaged with these policies, because again, this isn't just a Mexico-US issue. This isn't just an undocumented immigrant issue. It's a much larger picture. Um, really important, as we've seen, to, uh, for individuals to run for office. We need individuals like you in the audience, like the individuals on this panel to run for office, individuals that actually care um, about 
about just in general other human beings and important to vote. Um, I unfortunately do not get that privilege to vote. Um, even with a DREAM Act, I will not become a US citizen until I'm about 45, I'm 30 years old now. So we need everybody else who does have that privilege to come out and vote. Um, so here is my contact information. Um, I'm more than happy to um, answer questions after the panel and really important to get engaged, advocate, and um, this is our amazing tagline, get your own docu-hustle on. Thank you so much for your time. So my name is Mohit Aaron. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator. Uh, before I begin, I just want to warn the audience, I've had some alcohol. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so if I ask the wrong kind of questions, you know, you can blame it on the bartender. <laughs> Um, all right, so also um, I'm going to start by talking about my own journey, right? I, I know, I know you're, gonna, you're, you're saying that we came here to hear the panelists, not the moderator. That's what happens when you give me alcohol. I like to speak about myself. <laughs> so let's begin. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Guhizri, but let, let me begin with my journey. Uh, I came uh, to the U.S. in 1995. I graduated in India from a uh, a university called ID Delhi uh, came to the US that year, August 1995, uh, on an F1 visa. Uh, graduated in 2000 uh, with a PhD and then joined my first company. Uh, it was a company called Zambil. Uh, I joined it in December <coughs> on an H1B visa. And believe it or not, I actually said no to Google. They tried to hire me. Uh, I instead joined this company, which actually went down. Um, so, you know, <laughs> things happen. <laughs> so I made my fair share of mistakes. Uh, then uh, in May 2001, so I'm still at this company, uh, May 2001 I applied for my green card in, in the EB2 category. People said that would be a really easy way to apply, and it's like, okay, fine, let's, let's do it. Uh, but then September 2000, 9-11 happened in September 2001, and uh, all green card processing was put on hold. So there you go, my green card plans were over. Uh, or so I thought. Um, so I left uh, that company and joined uh, Google, finally, you know, um, four years later than I, when I could have joined it. So Feb 2003, I joined Google. I applied again for a green card in the EB1 category this time. This one, I'm going to get it this time. Outstanding researcher category, right? Uh, and uh, I did get it one year later. So um, that's finally one, one thing done. December 2007, I left Google, joined uh, uh, another startup. It was called Asti Data Systems. It was a data warehousing startup. It was sold a couple of years later to a bigger company called Teradata. But before that happened, uh, I started my first company. It was a company in, I started in September 2009 along with a couple of co-founders. It was a company called, it is a company called Nutronix. Um, that was started in 2009, went IPO in 2016. Uh, it was uh, it did something called hyperconvergence for primary storage, some sort of mumbo jumbo in storage. Um, <laughs> seems to have worked. And uh, in December 2009, I got my US citizenship. Um, from that point onwards, um, you know, in Jan, after spending nearly three and a half years at my first company, Nutronix, I left that to start my current company. And that's a little bit more mumbo jumbo. It's called hyperconvergence of secondary storage. And, <laughs> and, 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 and that's. That's my story, <laughs> right? So uh, as I said, it's, it's more about the panelists here, not about me. So let's, um, I'd like to introduce our, our eminent uh, and distinguished panelists. So the first one um, is Iba Masood. She, uh, I'd like her to speak a little bit about her company. Her company is, uh, she's the co-founder and CEO of, of a company called Tara. So Iba, would you like to say a few words about your company? Uh, sure. Um, firstly, thank you so much to uh, VLab for giving us the opportunity um, to speak about ourselves, which we don't get to do enough, apparently. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, uh, it's great to be here today. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background about my journey. Um, so it was actually three years ago um, to, this, to this day 
uh, that um, uh, that I uh, was was in, that, that I uh, that I came to the U.S. And, and so my journey really started on a tourist visa, um, a B1, B2. I'm originally Pakistani. I was uh, born and raised uh, in the Middle East. Um, and, uh, and so in January, 2000, January 2015, um, I was uh, you know, in California. And this was, um, this was right, right when we had uh, gone into Y Combinator, so into, into YC. And, and it's, funny, it's funny, like right before we got into YC, we were interviewing late. Um, and, uh, and so what happened was uh, my passport was actually stolen. Um, and, and so I remember like, you know, the kind of back and forth trying to get the passport and actually trying to secure the interview. But funny story, uh, my, when my co-founder Sayed and I came for our, for our interview, um, we, firstly, because we were interviewing late, the, the acceptance rate is about 0.1% if you're, um, inter if you're interviewing after the application deadline. And, and so we were like, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, we're in, we're in the, we're in the U S um, uh, we we're here for the first time. So let's go and, you know, get as many t-shirts that say California, San Francisco, you know, like cool, like, or Laguna beach or, you know, so the, the, uh, just like, you know, cool cities or cool slogans or whatever that will really stand out in the middle East. Let's get as many of those as we can. They're on sale, like five bucks. And, and so this was after a YC interview. Uh, I remember we had the interview after that. I was like, let's just go to the mall, get as many, you know, um, Laguna Beach or whatever t-shirts we can, because we don't know if we're going to get in. Like the chances are so, so minuscule. And I remember we got the call while I was like, you know, in the clearance rack, picking out, uh, picking out some, uh, some t-shirts uh, that we got in. And we had only packed uh, for six days. We thought we were only going to stay in the US for six days. Um, but my, my kind of obsession with um, moving to the US actually started when I was around uh, 14. Um, I'd been reading Paul Graham's essays um, since I was very young. Um, I started college, I was 16 at the time. I graduated by the time I was 19. I worked at GE and McKinsey for a bit as well. Um, this, was, uh, this was in the Middle East. But I'd always dreamed of like moving to the US and um, I was kind of obsessed with the idea of this meritocracy. Um, and that, you know, that, that, uh, that perhaps a true meritocracy really exists in the US. And so like against my parents' wishes, um, I come from a very traditional Pakistani Muslim family. And, uh, and so against my parents' wishes, I kind of packed my bags uh, with about $300 and a tourist visa, and I moved to the US. Uh, and so um, it's, been, it's been three years. Um, we, uh, after we got our tourist visa, and this, it's so funny, like while we were going through YC, we were on this tourist visa, and we didn't even know if we could you know, stay in the US, and we were building this company. Um, you know, we, were, um, we, had, we had already like, uh, had a proof of concept in terms of our algorithm. And so what we did initially was we were building this recruiting algorithm that would look at a developer's existing code. Because we thought of this, you know, the whole um, myth and the fallacy of the 10x engineer. And so could you actually analyze a programmer's existing code on GitHub um, and be able to systematically and quantitatively tell who is a better programmer. Um, and so we call that algorithm TARA, T-A-R-A. Um, stands for Talent Acquisition and Recruiting Automation. Um, and my co-founder, who's actually a roboticist by trade, um, uh, one of the things that happened was we, you know, we were thinking very very quantitatively, I mean, could we actually stay in the US and build a company here? And then what happened in June of 2015 was we applied for our O1, which was our extraordinary ability visa, um, reserved for people in the top three to 4% of their skill category. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so we, we got that um, just by submitting a 400 page double-sided application. Um, that, that, and then it included, um, if, you know, from the time that I was in nursery, like they specifically were even asking where I went to where, where I went to kindergarten, you know, because you can really tell the signs of extraordinary ability from that age. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, so um, we, we, yeah, so we had to be in the top three to four percent of our skill category, and then from there we applied for our EB1, which we applied for last year. Um, got the EB1, uh, which is uh, also, as you, as you mentioned, also reserved for the top one to two percent of your skill category, and that was an 800-page double-sided application. <laughs> So, uh, so that's, that's kind of our story. Um, and so I received my green card about two months ago. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and in terms of what our company does, yes. Yeah, so what we're, what we're doing with, um, what we're doing with Tara is that it's, it's an intelligent product builder. It scopes out these software products and then it starts to decide and assign um, who are the right engineers, um, specifically contractors that can be assigned um, to, these, uh, to, uh, to these specific tasks and milestones uh, for, for software products. And so like our customers are Cisco, Ford, larger Fortune 500 companies, but then also small companies and startups that are looking to get their software products off the ground and use machine learning to do it more efficiently. So yeah, that's us in a nutshell. All right. 
So, ne next one up is uh, Tenson Seldon. Um, she's the co-founder and CEO of a company called Kinsta. Would you like to describe uh, what the company does and your journey leading up to the company? Okay. Um, let, I think I'll start with my journey first. Can everyone hear me? No? Yes? Kind of? Okay, how about now? Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to VLab again. Um, the panelists and I were speaking earlier and we said this is perhaps one of the most well-organized volunteer machine we've ever, <laughs> lots of, you know, very, very incredibly um, well-organized and coordinated efforts. So thank you so much for having us here. Um, I think my company, really, the journey of, the, of Kinstep wouldn't um, start without the origin of my story and my family's story. I am Tibetan, uh, I'm sure the name Tenzin, for some of you may indicate that. It's one of the most common Tibetan names. I get people coming up to me and being like, you know, Tenzin, wow, what a unique name. And I'm like, yeah, meet my brother, his name is also Tenzin. And my sister-in-law and my, you know, every other person in my family. Um, Joking aside, my parents are originally from Tibet and they escaped during the 1960s when the Chinese government invaded our country. Um, and I remember the stories of them walking through the Himalayas and dodging soldiers' bullets to make it to India. My mother actually sits in the audience today at the, in the corner in the Tibetan dress. Um, <laughs> And these are the stories of the very haunting stories that I remembered growing up and um, with was, was the stories of a refugee, of being an asylum seeker, of someone knowing that the, India was a home and yet it was not a home. And I think often hundreds of millions of refugees and asylum seekers around the world are asking the same questions. The question of identity, what is our identity? Where do we belong? Um, and I grew up in the Himalayas, in, in the mountains, living really, in essence, in awe of every single thing around me. Most of my family members have a connection to the monastery. My uncle is a monk. My great aunt is a nun. And so knowing very well that I was placed in a country that, which was completely nonviolent, um, India was very kind to the Tibetans and very kind to my mother and I, um, that it allowed us to even go to the schools there. So I went to first a refugee school that was operated by UNHCR. And then my family, my mother and father, you know, they picked up the pieces that they had, the, the, the meager amounts of money that most immigrant families, you know what I'm talking about, that we earn to make sure that our child gets to go to that one school. And I am a product of that. I'm a product of that deliberate level of hard work and a testament to that. So in 1991, the US Congress passed a bill that allowed for 1,000 Tibetan refugees to come to America. And yet again, my mother won that lottery. Only a 1,000. <laughs> again, my mother won that lottery. And as a result of that, we were, had to be disunited, um, and I did not see my mother for about seven to ten years, a decade. And this is often also a struggle and journey of many immigrant families, is that they have to be torn apart in order for them to be able to salvage their dream, in order to be able to live a dream. And that happened to my family and I. My two brothers and I were educated in India, um, while my mother made sure that she worked here every single day, working every underpaying job you can imagine, working under the table seven days a week to buy the flight ticket so that we can come here. And 10 years later, we did. Um, I went to high school in Minnesota. I know, you, some of you are looking at me like, Minnesota, what were you doing there? <laughs> By the fortune of the US government, one of the welfare systems and refugee programs was that they integrated asylum seekers and refugee families in places like the Midwest, in places like the South, because they knew that integration could perhaps be a lot easier given that there are more resources. Um, and the, the Christian and Catholic Church were very generous in terms of helping us finding jobs 
identifying neighborhoods where we can shop at the grocery store, teaching us English. Um, so after several years of English as a second language, um, yet again, my mother trailblazed and decided that she no longer wanted to work just a menial job. And so she moved to California to start a small business. And it was a shop that we were fortunate enough to have our family survive on. So I w went to community college in Oakland. And uh, I knew that in order for my American dreams to to transpire, I had to get educated. And the journey of a refugee or an immigrant is not one where you get integrated right away. It's very difficult. Imagine that for the one, on the one hand, I'm a Tibetan. On the other hand, I'm, I was also born and raised in India. And then yet, I have to migrate to this country. What am I? And I came here. Uh, I went to community college. And by the luck of the draw, and through sheer hard work, I transferred to Stanford and went on to become the first Tibetan American Rhodes Scholar to go to Oxford. And in these circles, I realized that it is incredibly important to not just lead communities, but to be members of them. At Stanford and at Oxford, so often I was with people who wanted to lead and start companies and organizations, but they had never been members of them. And I knew that if anything I did in my life, any service I devoted to, it had to be one where I had membership. And so I spent a few years at the United Nations um, working in diplomacy to try to really understand the inertia of the problems that I dealt with as a child, which was the struggle of a refugee. And what is international policy, governments, private sector, what are they doing? And so worked there for a few years and decided the UN was not the answer. The UN in its capacity and its latitude could do a lot, but it cannot be enough. And the driving change to ensuring that immigrants and refugees like my mother and I have integrity and dignity in our lives will have to also be driven by private sector solutions. And so therefore, a year ago, I founded a company called Kinstep. Kinstep connects immigrants and refugees to safe and steady jobs. We have, within our access for the last year, we've had access to over tens of thousands of immigrants and refugees. And every single day, some of them are here, actually, some of our employers, as well as our employees who work with us. We connect immigrants and refugees to jobs that give them integrity and jobs that they can have a pipeline to succeed in the future. All right, next one, I'm going to ask Gary uh, Kurek, uh, who's the founder and CEO of Cougar, to talk about his journey and his company. All right, well, I'm from Canada, uh, so I'll try to, add, <laughs> try to add as much pepper to this as I can. But uh, So I, I'm from uh, northern Alberta, Canada, uh, where Wolverine is from as well, uh, or where he spent some time, I think. Anyway, uh, I grew up on a... Uh, uh, Buffalo Ranch up there, so I grew up as a farm kid, surrounded by uh, oil fields near uh, Fort McMurray, Alberta. Uh, and uh, I, I was actually just there, it was 46 below zero when the power went out. And so California's great. Uh, <laughs> but getting to that, uh, I, I uh, grew, up in that, uh, grew up in that environment, somewhat of a, a low-tech environment, minus the fact that my dad was an electronics engineer. Um, he was kind of the kind of the techie in the town, the computer guy sort of thing. It was a small town I grew up in. And uh, my mom was the farmer. She still runs a, a ranch of about 500 uh, buffalo up there. And uh, I always liked building things, uh, fixing farm equipment, uh, tinkering a lot. And uh, a lot of my family lived fairly close together. You know, Both sets of grandparents were like a few miles away from each other drive. Um, very close to uh, my grandmother in particular. And in 2004, I would have been probably about 12 years old uh, at the time, she, uh, she ended up getting sick with uh, cancer. And based on watching her uh, sort of debilitating state, going from a point of being very independently, uh, independently mobile to being a, uh, in a state where she, need, you know, she was uh, sort of tied up a lot and using a cane and walker and things like that, um, I, d I decided to build her a new type of uh, wheelchair, which was like a walker wheelchair combination. So she could use the device as a walker when she was able to, but also as uh, 
a convenient wheelchair so that she could always be independently mobile despite her varying uh, uh, condition. And this project, uh, I ended up getting entered into a science fair. I had a science teacher who just said, hey, you should try this out. And that ended up in my first year making it to a national, uh, to the Canadian National Science Fair. And then I just built on that project for four years and went into further types of wheelchairs uh, as I started working with, with, with more people. Uh, different patients who had different levels of uh, disability. So I ended up building, it was actually the world's first modular stair climbing wheelchair uh, by my senior year of uh, high school. So it was like a modular kit, which could be used as a base wheelchair. You could add pieces to it. It could climb up and down stairs, bring users to a standing position. Uh, ended up winning the uh, National Science Fair with it, and it started getting some commercial interest. So that became uh, a company for a short period of time. And uh, just as I was about to go to uh, university, uh, you know, saw the movie The Social Network, um, and you know I, I saw that scene where it's been you know Peter Thiel give Mark you know gave Mark Zuckerberg his first five hundred thousand dollars, and I was just thinking to myself I was like oh, I wonder if this Peter's guy this Peter guy is real and uh, you know looked him up oh yeah he is seems pretty cool and it's pretty you know it seemed to be you know he was you know he was in Silicon Valley and sure enough like a few weeks later um, he he announced uh, the Thiel Fellowship Program, and I thought okay I have this wheelchair I kind of want to commercialize and company I want to build and kind of admire Silicon Valley. That's where things are, you know, done at scale and it's the, the meritocracy that everyone wants to be a part of. And, you know, it's just the American dream to go. Plus it's 45 below zero here and I know <laughs> California would be a great change of pace. So I ended up applying to the uh, Teal Fellowship and uh, to my surprise, I got in uh, as part of the first class in uh, 2011. And that sort of began my whole immigration process. Uh, my plan was to stay in uh, the US for good. And I started with a work visa. So I didn't have a, a bachelor's degree or anything. So the H-1B visa was ruled out. Um, and a lot of the kind of TN, uh, you know, NAFTA-based visas seemed kind of finicky and not very stable. So uh, my lawyer said, well, why don't you just try for the uh, O-1, which is the ex Extraordinary Ability Visa. And I said, how many of these have you filed? He goes, a few. I said, any denied? Uh, no. Has anybody my age ever gotten it? Not that I know of, but I think you have the evidence. OK, so I, I tried. And I ended up getting that uh, visa, luckily. And she told me afterwards that I was the youngest Canadian that ever got the O1A visa. Uh, so I ended up uh, moving here to California. And due to some uh, you know, regulatory issues and things like that, the wheelchair project was uh, going to be a real pain to uh, move forward. Uh, but I ended up working on that for uh, a little while. Uh, a few years ago, I applied for the uh, EB1 green card, and I was able to uh, get that as well. So I've had that for about two years, so the immigration situation is uh, relatively stable. Uh, but in, in, the, in the process of you know, building wheelchairs and building hardware, uh, I, I was starting to notice, you know, I got very involved in the Silicon Valley uh, robotics community, and. Uh, and in the whole sort of manufacturing space as well, and the whole, the whole field of automated manufacturing. And I had a lot of problems with trying to build products here uh, in the US or in Canada, or just in general, building hardware is hard. Um, and then I ended up kind of finding myself in a place where I was trying to kind of rethink manufacturing itself. Um, and, and using the, the method that we did to sort of change wheelchairs, which was you know, mass customization from a, a core platform of pieces, uh, my current company, Cougar, is now doing that with uh, robotics manufacturing equipment and essentially mechatronic systems as we understand them. So instead of having catalogs of millions of or even thousands of uh, u uh, unique parts, pieces, SKUs, uh, different control systems, different uh, uh, you know, various protocols and architectures, we've been able to sort of take somewhat of an Apple approach where we're building a very cohesive platform of core pieces that allows us to build things like ranges of different sizes of uh, robotic arms and CNC uh, milling tools. Uh, and, you know, essentially entire factory lines end to end that we, uh, that we own. Uh, and in doing that, there's, there's many different capabilities and processes that we've been able to drive the cost down by, you know, 80% or higher, thus making uh, automated manufacturing at scale in the U.S. and other developed economies competitive with uh, the, the uh, low-cost labor and the scale that exists overseas. So we have a very lofty goal of uh, bringing manufacturing back to this country uh, and, to, and to countries like the U.S. And that's what our uh, you know, platform and what Cougar is focused on doing right now. Um, and we see our platform being used in many other uh, industries in the future. Um, but I think manufacturing is big enough of a goal for now. And, 
uh, that's what we're working on, and that's a little bit about me. All right, next up is uh, Adelanwa Adesanya. I hope I'm saying that name right. Yes, you are. All right, uh, he's the co-founder and CEO of Moving Analytics. Um, go for it. Awesome. Uh, so good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. A uh, lot of great faces. Um, thank you, Vila, for the opportunity. And wow, is everyone now inspired by the stories? I'm here as an immigrant, and I'm just like, wow, this is, this is an amazing panel. So um, it's, it's, it's good company to be part of. Um, so my own journey, I grew up in Lagos, Nigeria, so, which is in West Africa. Um, and I always thought I wanted to be an engineer. My dad was a software engineer. Um, and he started his first company in our three-bedroom apartment. So we slept in one room, and the rest of the, the, the apartment was the office. And to keep me from disturbing him, he let me play Prince of Persia on the computer. So that was kind of how I got into computing. Um, and that started my journey. And I started reading about Silicon Valley. Um, and I used to have this, and I was enamored by Bill Gates and what he did um, through Microsoft and for computing but he did a lot of charity work in Nigeria, and I was like, how can a human being wake up in the morning and decide, I want to eradicate polio, and he could do that? So Bill Gates was this idol for me, and I used to have this um, binder where I had his, his photo all through high school. Um, so through high school, I got involved in different science projects, um, and I got a fair for engineering, and when it was time to go to college, my dad was like, well, where do you want to go? And I was like, I want to go to America. I want to be part of Silicon Valley. Um, so I started applying to different schools. I got into a bunch of them. And then my dad was like, OK, so where do you want to go? And I'm like, where's the warmest? Because I had watched a lot of movies, and I saw cold and snow. And I was like, hell no. Like, Nigeria is like 90 degrees on average. Um, so I was like, where's the warmest? And he said, Houston, Texas. So I ended up. <laughs> Going to Houston, Texas, I didn't care about the, the ranking of the school or whatever. So I went to the University of Houston and I studied electrical engineering there. And kind of in my junior year, I figured I get this engineering stuff. Um, I can do the math and physics, but I'm not very excited by it. Um, and I so I, I really wanted to get into entrepreneurship. So I, doubted, I dabbled into entrepreneurship then. I'm just like you. I watched the social network. And I had this group of friends where we used to argue about who's better, is Microsoft or Apple? And we spent hours each day just you know, debating. And I said, you know what? We need to start a company. So the first startup I, I, I built was this company called Gift Pals. And the whole idea was to allow people on campus to buy and sell or trade goods and services with each other. And we looked at the bookstore and said, hey, the bookstore is ripping us off. Um, so why don't we build a platform that lets us you know, transact? And that was very interesting because um, we had about 3,000 users on campus use that product. And I'll go around um, campus and see people wear this t-shirt. And I was just like, wow, like I, I could take an idea from my head. And people were using it. So that really caught my, my interest. That business ended up not working. But um, I then decided that, you know what? Houston, Texas is great, but the summers ended up being actually way warmer than Nigeria, and it was worse. So I was like, you know what, I need to get out of here. So I decided California was next adventure. Um, so I, I went to the University of Southern California for graduate school. I studied engineering management. Um, but I also got a job there where I worked with professors who had patents that they wanted to commercialize and I wanted to start businesses around. So I worked on different projects from artificial eyes to nanotechnology to just a wide gamut. Um, and one of the projects I ended up working became Moving Analytics. Uh, so for Moving Analytics, what we do is our mission is to conquer cardiovascular disease as a leading cause of death globally. And the way we do it is through digital prevention programs. So we work with patients that either have a very high risk for heart disease or, or have recently had a heart attack and we work with them and the cardiologists to help the patients manage their risk factors. So looking at things like how we can improve the exercise, how we can reduce you know, their smoking if they smoke, um, how we reduce the stress, their hypertension. So we partnered with Stanford, and together we built this clinical program that is delivered through patient smartphones. So um, what we're doing is we're giving people more access to preventive cardiac services. So that's what we do. Um, on the immigration story, um, so we raised, in 2016, we raised about $1.5 million. This is highlight of my life. I'm like in Silicon Valley, you know, living the dream. And my lawyer calls me and says, 
Ade, you have 15 days to leave the country. And I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? And she said, well, you applied for um, your work visa. You got accepted in lottery, but they denied your application because they said your degree didn't match your job title. So you studied engineering, you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't match. <laughs> and so, yeah, you had to go. And I was like, well, I don't pay you to tell me I had to go. So we had to figure this out. So I ended up having... <laughs> Yeah, I, this, this is in fun, by the way. It's, 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 it's so nice to be able to laugh about it. But I had very, very few options. And the only option I had was actually, number one, firing myself because I couldn't compromise the business. Um, so I had to fire myself, and then I had to go back to school. So I was like, wow, okay. So people who know me know that I vowed that you couldn't pay me to go back to school. So going back to school is just a terrible idea. So I went to UCLA. I, I, go, I said, you know, I want to do venture capital later down the road, so why don't I go to study finance? So I got a certificate in finance out of UCLA, and then UCLA allowed us in our second semester to do an internship. So I applied back to my company as an intern. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was an intern, and then eventually I, I um, at this time I worked on, I was going to school full time, I was working, working my job without getting paid, um, and I was also doing different kind of immigration applications. So I ended up applying for this special kind of green card for people whose job was in the national interest of the country. So because of our work is in healthcare and it's very um, important to the country, that was the pathway for me to come back. So it's been a very interesting journey, um, but happy to be here. Before we start our regular set of questions, I do have a question for you, Adil Anwar. Uh, a few years back, I was getting a lot of emails from Nigeria. Were you the one sending all the <laughs> I think it was all my cousins. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so we're going to begin our question and answer session. I'm going to be asking questions um, to our panelists. And I'm uh, going to give you a couple of minutes, uh, maybe one or two minutes to answer. Uh, we're going to go through a bunch of questions. So I'll ask each one of you the same question in, you know, turn by turn. So Iba, will start with you. So the question is, you're running a company. What gave you the inspiration uh, for the idea for the company? And how did you evaluate that a viable business can be built around it? So a lot of people come to me for, you know, oh, I have this cute idea, and uh, I want to do a company on this. Um, but more often than not, it's really a project within a company, not mm -hmm. a company in itself. You can't build a viable business around it. So how did you evaluate? How did you get the inspiration, and how did you evaluate the idea, and you felt confident that you can actually go and do a business around it? Well, um, with Tara specifically, I think the inspiration really came from just uh, how software development as a whole, in terms of um, uh, in terms of as a field, um, if you look at if you look at IT projects and even just um, software projects in general, just over 40% of them uh, go over budget and over time, and uh, and it actually leads to a loss of about 66 billion dollars. So the statistics are pretty staggering. Um, and then so we were looking at um, software development as a um, as a space. How how could you uh, make software projects more predictable? Like that was that was our um, initial uh, initial goal. And then. You know, we we had this hypothesis around the world of work, um, how you know freelancing is is I mean, like Forbes estimates by the year 2020, 40 percent of America will be freelancing, and and so that's pretty it's pretty staggering. Um, and so looking at some of these um, some of these statistics and um, and so I, I had been working uh, in I had been working with RPA for um, for I think just over a decade or so. Um, so I started my first research project in college. I was around 16 at the time. I was working on um, robotic process automation, specifically within um, within operations and looking into like how you could you know just build like simple scripts um, to uh, to reduce the amount of man labor and man hours in terms of like manual manual work. And my co-founder Sayed. Um, he was working with big data um, in Australia with, with the government, and and then he was he's, he had also worked with Boeing, um, Boeing uh, here. And one of the <clears throat> one of the common threads that we found was, firstly, you know, there's a lot of data available online, um, open source data, and you can essentially use utilize that open source data to train to in, in some ways train an engine to understand how to break down a software development project. 
And, and if you look at the, uh, the number of people that are building software today, roughly about 60 to 65 percent of them are non-technical, like they've never, they've never written a line of code in their, in their lives. And so, um, and, and they're building like incredible products. So one of the, you know, so seeing these kind of trends, um, what we first did in, in terms of as an MVP or as a prototype was we actually like built this very uh, small scale chatbot. Um, it was very simple. What it did, what Tara did was you could, uh, you could say things like, hi Tara, build me an iOS app. She would then start asking you questions about what you're looking to build and then give you a quote and say, okay, in 24 hours, I'll get a team together to assign. And, and in the back end, what was happening was it was me on like, you know, phone interviews and, <laughs> um, with programmers. That was one to like um, uh, assess communication skills. And then the second thing we were doing was we had this like very basic algorithm that would look at their GitHub, uh, GitHub code, like open source, and then just give them a score. And so based on that score, we were just like assigning teams of developers very quickly in the back end. Um, and, uh, and, and so where we really, I, th I think, you know, um, in terms of like within an entrepreneur's journey, the way to really look at it is you need to build something that is like just viable enough to get out into the market, validate and test the idea. And I mean, for, from my perspective, I think sales cures all. I think like, you know, revenue and actually getting, um, getting some form of uh, customer validation in the form of like someone's willing to swipe a credit card. Um, that was really what gave us like that initial validation. And then kind of like um, uh, about 11 months after, after we launched that first chatbot, we, you know, we, we, we got our first project from Cisco. And, and so that really provided the validation. And the other aspect of it was also we, we realized that using, using machine learning and using like these feedback loops, we could get software development time cut in half um, and, uh, and, even, and costs reduced by anywhere between 60 to 75% in terms of actually getting um, an iOS app or, um, or you know, a, 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 platform, a web platform in React out into the, out into the market. Yeah, that's so, cool. So let's yeah. move to Tanzan. How about yourself? Yeah, um, for me, I think it was a combination of realizing that the issue that I worked on with Kinstep, as, as I said, I moved back to this country after having spent um, about five years abroad. And so you can imagine my surprise coming back here. It's like, wow, America and San Francisco surely has changed quite a bit. Um, and I knew that for me, the plight to become an entrepreneur had to be one that where I had to have greater proximity to the issue I cared about. Because I think that proximity gives you two things. The first is that it gives you the ability to understand the problem you're dealing with with the greater texture. And second is that with proximity, you can build a sustainable company or organization. So I situated myself, even though I was in San Francisco, I was like actually traveling around the country for the first six months before I founded Kinstep. Um, I went around, I knew that th there had to be a lot of marketplace data that I had to collect to, to, to understand that this could be a viable product and one that could be scaled through not just altruism, but scaled through finan financial incentives. So found out that you know, 12 million plus Americans um, have an immigrant background that are either underemployed, unemployed, or working under the table. And the under the table economy in America is often very exploitative. It really preys on the people who are the most vulnerable, those that don't have advocates those that may not have the ability to come to a room like this or pay for a ticket. Um, and I wanted to make sure that my entrepreneurship was a proxy to those people and that I advocated for on behalf of their struggles. So um, I went around this country and I talked to hiring managers from the Trump, the Trump Towers to Deloitte consultants to Starbucks hiring managers and I basically asked them, what are your one to two main problems and why are you not being able to fix it in terms of the human capital? And time and time again, retention became a big problem. Well, Starbucks or, or, or even the, you know, the Trump Towers would say, the reason we use immigrant laborers is because they tend to stay longer. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, this is a demographic that has been exploited. However, has this demographic ever been seen as capital? Has been seen as one that we can replenish, nurture, work with, collaborate with? Uh, no, not to my knowledge. And I had outreach within those six months to International Rescue Committee, to the United Nations um, you know, HCR, and to many small local organizations that were working on the immigrant crisis. And I, all of them would say one thing to me, was that 
We wish more tech entrepreneurs would help us build the technology and the platform that can help utilize and see this community as, as a demographic that is valuable, that adds credibility, that they, they, they are strong workers. So on both ends, on the migrant ends, you know, the, the, the immigrants who are working under the table, the millions who are driving the $2 trillion economy of the U.S., the 10% of the U.S. GDP, a substantial amount of that. Shut up time a little bit, so we're move. Sorry? We're gonna move to Gary. So oh yeah, sorry. So, that, so yeah, uh, KinStep really is, the focus of it is to make sure that we empower and enable those immigrants. Thank you. Gary, how about yourself? Yeah, so uh, my company, Cougar, it was a bit of a, a, a vortex I kind of got sucked into. Uh, <laughs> the, I've always been fascinated with uh, ro uh, robotics and mechatronic systems. Uh, even the wheelchairs I built with uh, my past projects and past company were effectively robots. Uh, and ever since I was you know, a toddler, I was just really fascinated with all things robots. And I, I still believe today that robotics uh, and a lot of people define robotics in different ways, but robotics in general is still an industry that I think is yet to have its heyday. It's still sort of in its mainframe era. Uh, and you know, I was kind of involved in the 2011, 2012 craze. It still exists today, the you know, collaborative robots and more uh, you know, smaller, cheaper, easy to program robots making their way into uh, uh, manufacturing and, and you know, more soft automation applications. And, and in that area, I felt there was really a literal arms race happening. Uh, a lot of different companies building uh, robotic arms. And initially, that's what my company was working on as well. Um, but then as we really got out into more, uh, into more factories and, and uh, hospitals and places where I think there's a, a, a large future potential for uh, robotic uses. Um, a lot of inefficiencies were not in just robot arms or uh, you know, those certain parts of a work cell. You know, I think that maybe constitutes five or 10% uh, of everything that's involved. And everything else was still seemed to be neglected and very fragmented. And the industry today is, uh, very much a very uh, large collection of sub-billion dollar companies, companies that are $10 million, $100 million or more, but there isn't you know, a $500 billion company that exists in uh, robotics today. And I really wanted to try and crack down on why that hasn't happened yet and what sort of standardization and taming of the Wild West, if you will, has to happen in order for that to come to uh, uh, fruition. And with, you know, with Cougar, we've been doing this for about three, three and a half years, but there's several core technologies that we've innovated on and that we're building to make that reality possible where we can have this very standardized platform, much like we have laptops and phones today that um, the robotics industry can itself be based on. Um, so this is a, you know, a lofty goal. This is like potentially a multi-trillion dollar problem. Um, and it is you know, very ambitious, but a few years ago, I had a personal situation where in an accident almost lost my life and kind of had that epiphany where I said, you know, anything I'm ever going to do from now on has to be really worthwhile. It has to be something very big, something potentially culture shifting. Um, so right now we're, you know, in effect using this platform we built with Cougar to change uh, automated manufacturing uh, as we know it. Today, automation, uh, you know, automated robotic manufacturing is used in less than 10% of the applications where it actually could be. Uh, that other 90%, even though they want it, for various reasons, it's not feasible, whether that's lack of skill or scale or economics. So we're trying to uh, address that and uh, really change the direction of the industry we're going in and hopefully affect other industries in the future. Uh, but ultimately, it was just a learning process. We kind of dug deeper and deeper um, into what was truly wrong. Um, and then ultimately, it was just a slow building of confidence of can we actually tackle a problem this, this large. Uh, and sure enough, you know, it took, took the big bite, and that's what we're working on now. So continue to be more and more expi uh, inspired by it because there's always more and more to learn. Cool. So, so my, my own experience in it kind of starting moving analytics is a little bit different. My business partner, Harsh, um, was a postdoc at USC, and they got in a pattern around using smartphones to track calories burnt while you're walking around. So I was assigned to him and we were like, yeah, let's go figure out a business with this technology. So I asked him, what, what problem are you solving? And he said, you know, being sedentary um, is worse than smoking and it's gonna kill everybody. So I was like, okay, wow. Um, so how do we go build a business around it? He was trying to build a fitness app that was gonna motivate people to exercise. And I said, you know, that's cool, but you know, 
everyone is buying a Fitbit, and that's tangible. So let's go find an enterprise solution for this technology. So we went to the hospital, and we asked doctors, essentially, when will someone die if they don't exercise? Like, let's find that most edge use case for the technology, and let's build something around that. So they said to us about chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes, and how um, it's important for people to exercise. That's a big way to prevent it. But for people that had it, that's also a big way for you to reduce the, the impact of those diseases. Um, but along the way, we met the American Heart Association, and we pitched them this idea. It's like, hey, we can build this app for tracking exercise. Um, why don't we do a collaboration together? And then they exposed us to this opportunity in cardiac rehabilitation. And they said, hey, you know, for people that have a heart attack, um, it's important to do cardiac rehab. This data shows if they do it, they live five years longer, they have half the risk of getting a second heart attack. But the problem today is only 15% of people do it. And that's because they live too far from a cardiac rehab center. Um, so we think there's a role for telemedicine and technology to play a role in cardiac rehab. So that's kind of how we got into there, um, and we, we started the company. Cool. Next question. We'll start from that end this time. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, every company needs funding uh, to do its operations, to survive, to hire people. Uh, can you describe your challenges, especially as, a, as an immigrant, uh, in raising that funding? And uh, what advice uh, would you like to give to our audience uh, mm. as a result? Yeah, raising capital, that's, that's, that's a story that I can keep you here for a long time with. Um, so we've raised about $2 million to date, um, but the first 400000 was the hardest. So when we started, I think one of the smart things we did is we bootstrapped the company, and we actually became the masters of winning business plan competitions. So we won more than $200,000 in competitions. Mm -hmm. So every weekend you find a competition, you won five grand and you pay the bills and you bought some ramen and you know, that's how we funded the company for a long time. Um, and you know, <laughs> that graduated into getting grants. Um, but when it got time to like, okay, this is really becoming serious and we want to grow the business, it took us 300 investor meetings and investors kept saying no, no, no. <laughs> I think the thing that kept us going through that was that we had talked to more than 100 cardiac rehab centers, and we knew that the, this problem had to be solved, and it was very important. And it was going to be us or someone else that was going to do it. So when an investor said no, I was like, okay, you either don't like me, you don't like my accent, I am not, maybe I woke up on the wrong side of bed, and I'm not communicating to you properly. Um, so really understanding that the problem we're solving was important kind of kept us through that. But we eventually got um, our first breakthrough when a seed stage fund um, called Launchpad Digital Health in San Francisco made the first investment in our business, and then they helped us um, get the other follow-on investors. So, cool. That was a Gary, what yourself? <clears throat> I think my experience has been mostly pretty good uh, in that regard. I think what I, what I do like about Silicon Valley and what I think a lot of investors also recognize here, maybe not all of them, but at least many that I've encountered, is that they, they do like the... Um, the hustle behind an immigrant story as well. They've before any any check is written or a dollar's been invested, there's a little more work, I think, that maybe most immigrants have to go through than what the typical American citizen might have to. And I think that in and of itself gives a you know sets a little bit of a precedent of how hard you're gonna work in uh, the future. And I think a lot of them find that commendable. Uh, so as long as you can be in a situation where you can you know, somewhat ensure that you'll be stable, even if that's just a work visa, or even if it's an arrangement of put in the money and maybe that'll be enough, you can help me get a work visa, something like that, uh, where you can kind of work that out and you're both agreeable that you're uh, in a sort of a stable place, then I don't think it's, it's as big of a problem uh, as some might think. Um, I think for, for us and Kinstep, we've been really privileged that we've actually not had to raise any money um, and that's because um, we have um, gone down the route of philanthropy because the political climate right now is such that a lot of people are taking out their checkbooks and, and wanting to support immigrant and refugee um, kind of s companies that work on this issue and also companies that 
that support um, enabling this population. So we've we've not had to thankfully um, be able to you know we've had we've had the full retention of our company. I, I think in addition um, our our clients really our partners in, we we've partnered with um, you know, Fortune 500 companies, um, Box, Airbnb. Uh, they are able to at least with each placement and see the value and, and also give um, from that. So we've, we've been um, generating quite a bit of revenue that we've not had to. Okay. Um, so in terms, of, uh, in terms of our scenario, um, we, we just announced our uh, 3 million seed. Um, and, uh, and so, but then like the, that kind of journey that it's taken to get to, get to our um, investor round has been pretty interesting because Tara is actually my second company. The first company I built, it was um, a graduate applicant tracking system that would help companies find graduates. And, and this was in the Middle East, like during the Arab Spring. So I remember, um, you know, when, uh, when, we, when I went out um, to actually try to raise some, try to raise money, um, what it, and we actually had uh, quite a few enterprise customers at that time with that company. And I remember like the first, um, the first, uh, uh, the, 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 the first yes that I received was from an investor who wanted to put in $30,000 for about 50% of the company. And, and he told me, I, I think this was maybe around f uh, f uh, three, three, four years ago, four years ago. And, um, and so he told me that I would, you know, and then when we said no, he said I would regret it for the rest of my life. Um, and... Uh, and, and so, I mean, you know, so like for, for the first company, then what we did was we actually business plan competitions, um, just continued to apply to those. Uh, and, you know, just as the money came in, like, like exactly what you said, you know, gave out payroll, but then also we had significant revenues as well. So with that first company, it was really just bootstrapped all the way through. Um, and then with Tara, we, we took a conscious decision to bring on um, investors and operators that had significant expertise in either, um, you know, just uh, within, uh, the, within building neural networks or whether it was uh, specific scaling up marketplaces or whether it was you know enterprise sales um, and so we were very cognizant of like who we brought on board and uh, and you know we were we, we were lucky but um but at the end of the day, luck takes a lot of hard work. So, uh, so you know, so I think um, just the kind of lessons that I had with like building that first company, um, I was able to apply to to the second. And uh, and at the at the end of the day, I mean, and I think one of the things that you said, the first uh, the first check is always the hardest. That was absolutely the case with us as well. But once you know, um, uh, once people saw the traction, once we were able to like you know show the big name logos that were actually using the product and getting some value out of it, um, then the fundraising process. Became a lot easier, and then we actually had to say no uh, to several investors, like during the end of our round. So, um, so I think it, uh, you know, just I think in in in, in our scenario, in, in our scenario, and whatever advice I typically give is usually to show some level of traction, um, where you know I know there have been several entrepreneurs who've been able to raise without a product, just on an idea, um, but that wasn't our case. Like we had we had version one of our product, we had uh, we had traction, and that was really when when we raised. And I think it's just um, it just makes for a more conscious decision, and that's what we wanted to do to raise money after. After we had some level of traction, because I think it just makes the future rounds easier, and you also have an idea of who your customers are as well. Um, I want to just say that I know you you asked for a piece of advice, and um, I think typically among refugee or immigrant founders, what because since I've you know, I've had the privilege of working with many, um, is one of the 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 issues is the self limiting behavior or a bias that, that is exhibited. And for any immigrants or refugees or, or entrepreneurs in this room, I think that's something that takes, it takes a lot of effort to be able to consciously work on that and to make sure that you don't let the self-limiting narratives, the doubts, you know, take it over um, and in any way proceed over your ability to, to just put yourself out there. Uh, my next question is about time management. Um, you know, we all know it gets really busy in our companies it gets really interrupt driven. Uh, we sometimes forget that we have families. How do you guys manage your time? How do you guys make sure that you can balance uh, what you do at work uh, with your personal life? So we'll start in the middle this time. Maybe Gary, you go first. Uh, I feel like that's something that's always evolving. You're always, <laughs> you're always like saying, okay, I have it now. This is how my days are gonna look. This is how my weeks are gonna look, my next few months. And then the, your whole life just changes somehow. And then, you, then you're just always chasing that dream of the perfect time management. But uh, as it stands right now, I have days kind of set up in like three core blocks where it's like two blocks are used for things that have to get done, stuff with the company, just to uh, maintain momentum. That third block is more kind of self-directed personal time. Uh, but that's probably going to change by tomorrow morning too. So who knows? <laughs> uh, but no, it's yeah, it's 
always an, an ever evolving thing, but I, I find there has to be some kind of balance between uh, like you have to give yourself a little bit of personal time to do what you want and not be totally consumed by your company because life is short, days are short, and you, <laughs> mm -hmm. you can get sucked in if you let yourself do it. And that'll burn you out, so. Tencent. Um, go ahead. No, so, so I think for me, um, I, I have the, the privilege of still being a single, single man. Um, <laughs> so, privilege uh, or burden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it can be a burden sometimes too. Um, but I, I speak more on the family side. So I, I have a standing meeting with my parents and my siblings at Sundays every two o'clock. So every Sunday at two o'clock, wherever you are, we all jump on Skype and we have a two hour chat and we catch up on what's going on. And that for me is kind of one thing I do to just keep, keep that because the rest of the week is just in flux. You really don't know what's gonna happen today. So that's, that's kind of what I do on, on the personal side to keep that balance. Um, I, I do two things. The first is uh, meditation. Um, and um, every, every morning, actually, I, I try to make sure that I don't um, start my day with a, a, either a, you know, going, checking my phone. I, I actually light an incense. And that's a ritual that I've built over the years so that I can make sure that I set my morning, at least, to have um, time for self-care. Because I, I do think that in this, I'm sure the panelists can agree that this is a, a profession and I think an industry where um, time is not always on our side and um, you have to be very intentional. And the second thing I do is I actually don't believe in balance. I think uh, balance is a myth. Um, I believe in priorities. And so um, if I prioritize my health and my family and, and things I love that give me self-care, and if I feel psychologically safe in anything, even if that means working you know, every single day, but still feeling psychologically safe, I think of that as balance. Um, so perhaps my definition of it may be a little bit different. Um, I think I'm probably the worst person to talk about time management, uh, <laughs> just because of the fact that um, I, uh, I, they're, 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 just because of the fact that I try to optimize my life to to a certain extent where I, for, for example, I've never worn matching socks. Is this something everybody knows? They think it's weird, but I just estimate it's going to take me three to five minutes per day to find, you know, matching socks, and so I should just pick out whatever, you know. And so, like, I have down to a routine where, like, even you know, dressing up is like a, a pretty much like you know a two and a half minute. And like, there were times where I would just be wearing the same thing every day. Uh, I'd be showering like every day for, um, and you know, and I was just and and like I was really, I mean, the, the, no joke. Like this is this is how I was the, prioritizing. Everyone is looking at your socks right now. <laughs> you can't see them. I'd be out there. <laughs> I'm wearing high tops today, but um, but you know it's just because um, it's just because like I was I mean I, and I and I still do it to this day to be honest like I I'm I'm someone who's just all in and uh, and I think I've um, and I, I I do believe that I should take um, more time off and you know understand what a weekend is yeah. uh, perhaps <laughs> and and you know and and pro probably prioritize family but you know what I did was uh, I married the smartest person I, I know. Um, and, uh, and you know, I, I actually married our CTO. And, and it's great, like he's never gonna leave the company now. <laughs> you know? Um, and he, 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 I mean, in no joke, Google, Palantir, they, they all keep messaging him and they're all like, and they all keep saying, you know, $250,000 uh, signing bonus. And he's my co-founder as well, but <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, he's never going to leave the company now, and so it's great because now you know we're and we're both kind of obsessive in that way. So, um, so you know, like our our days are typically um, you know our, our days are typically consumed by the company as they are, and so are our nights. But uh, but it's it's great. I think it kind of just works for us because that's just the kind of person I've I've always been. Um, like I remember like I was uh, when I was 16, I was like, oh, you know, I'm joining college too late. I should have been 13. I wish you know university allowed me to join at an earlier age. Uh, but one thing I'm really trying to do as an executive though is you know so take time, just kind of think back, be a more thoughtful about some of our some of our decisions because sometimes. I think you know you're trying to run so fast that um, that it's specifically health. I think you know health-wise, it can really really catch up to you. But I mean, then I'm just like you know I'll think about that when I'm in my 30s. So, <laughs> <laughs> can I have the audience questions? Yeah. Yeah. My name is uh, Sergey. I'm an international student from Russia, and I have a question for you. It's difficult sometimes when you're international like students or you're immigrant, especially undocumented. You always worry that you 
can be like deported for some reasons. Let's say if you didn't take enough units um, for classes, which happened to me actually one time, and they yeah, deported me for one week. And how do you like overcome this worriness um, and still keep doing what what you want to do and like pursuing your passion and career? Thank you. So, uh, Tencent, why don't you go go first? So, the, uh, well, the question was that how how do you balance both the you being an immigrant and also the pursuing your passion? How do you overcome? Yeah, how do you how do you overcome the stress of? like thoughts that you can be deported when you are <laughs> The thoughts that you can be deported. Well, I'm fortunate enough that I don't have to struggle with those thoughts because you know, I, I do have um, citizenship now in this country. However, there are hundreds of thousands um, and millions of people um, in America and around the world who do struggle with the anxiety and some of whom I have a chance to work with the, the stress and, and I think it's more than anxiety, I think it's um, fear uh, that a, any day that they can be isolated, any day that they can um, face impu you know, puni punitive um, measures by the government to, um, to get them out of this country. And so that is actually a, a rampant fear that a lot of people I talk to have. And it, it actually makes it very difficult to pursue your dreams when you live with that fear every single day. And I've seen that inhibit and stifle some of the people that I've worked with. But to that I say that it, the onus is on us. It's on the people who have the privilege to, to have a voice, as the, as the researcher earlier had pointed out, that we can do more. Um, and we should do more to advocate for them. Um, how about you? I, 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 I really don't have experience on that topic, but I think maybe Ileana, who's, who's living that, could probably be a better mm -hmm. person yeah. to give that answer. You want to try? Let's put on the spot here, but um, no, I think that, you know, going back to, to the issue of undocumented immigration, I think it's something, it's turned out to be a way of life for us now. You know, I grew up with the fear that my parents could get deported at any time since I was a little girl, and I think that um, it's taken psychologically a toll on many individuals. Um, I've been undocumented for 22 years, so um, I think that when you tell somebody that they can't go to school, they can't work, they can't drive, they can't do all these things, it, it, it really has affected a lot of individuals um, uh, much much more than I, I think that I, I could ever imagine. I think I've been extremely privileged, but I think that there are many other individuals who did get their wings cut off, and um, that's why the need is there for advocacy and for um, you know more comprehensive immigration reform um, to pass. All right, let's give more people a chance to ask questions. Um. Hi, my name is Sophie Alcorn, and I'm an immigration attorney in Mountain View. I'm the owner of, and founder of Alcorn Immigration Law, and we do immigration for innovation. And I really appreciate you guys sharing your stories. That's very brave. Um, I know it's really hard for people to get up on stage and do that. And I think here in Silicon Valley, you know, there's, there's two strikes against immigration um, that the rest of the country sees. One is, you know, why, sh why do we want people from other countries in the United States? And then number two, why do they want them coming to Silicon Valley and automating our jobs and taking them away from us? Um, I am a firm, ardent believer in immigration, uh, especially here in Silicon Valley, but I'm wondering what your perspective is on what you could tell the people who are listening to the State of the Union tonight about why, why this is important and why they should, should be open to this concept. What does it boil down to for you? Thank you. Gary, I'll let you take that. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> prior to this, I actually just spent two months in China. And it's quite amazing to see how, how uh, swift, uh, I would say, that whole part of the world is uh, growing and how rapidly uh, entrepreneurs uh, many who have been educated in the U.S. are going back home and are starting literally towers and towers of, you know, worth of people and startups are, uh, you know, building out there. I, I, I personally believe, as any country, it's in their best interest to bring the best and brightest in um, and give them the best opportunities that you can if you do want to not just have a leadership position in uh, the world, but just to stay relevant and to uh, stay ahead. And I think... The United States has a lot of uh, strong anchors that want to bring people here. Uh, and I think we have to work very, very hard and you know, essentially tirelessly to maintain that. 
And I think uh, a lot of people in this country need to realize how fast the rest of the world is also providing very uh, good incentives to bring the best and brightest uh, to their countries as well. So I am fully just on board 110% with bringing the best and brightest here. And I think uh, we should continue to push to do that as a country. Time for a question. Thank you. Um, maybe one more question. OK, one more question. I'm going to be wrapping up. Go for Good it. evening. Um, John Bader, I'm the co-founder of Maptopia. We provide smart utility data to smart cities. My question is, you know, I was raised by immigrants. I'm an immigrant myself. How American do you feel? Because I <laughs> grew up here thinking I have to go back home to feel like I had a place I belonged. And I realized being American was actually contributing back to this country. So that's what I wanted to ask you. How American do you feel and how would you describe being an American? Eva? Well, I mean, as someone who's only been here for three years, I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer that question. <laughs> uh, but I mean, you know, just in terms of like, well, one thing I'll mention is, um, if you notice my vernacular and like my accent, it's American. And one of the reasons that is, is because um, I, was, I was very young, I think this was around when I was five to six years old, I realized um, that, uh, that, you know, that there are obviously accents in English, you know, there's the American accent, there's the British accent. So I had a British accent for about two, three years that I was trying to emulate. <laughs> After watching after watching TV shows, and and it was funny like um, during um, uh, just uh, uh, growing up, uh, it was it was at a, a very young age around I think it was 10, 10 and a half, 11 years old, where I was like, okay, if I learn the American vernacular or the American accent, I think I'll be taken much more seriously. Uh, I think uh, I'll have better job opportunities, and uh, I think I'll be able to sound more like an international citizen. And so what I actually did consciously was I started watching you know just American TV sitcoms. I tried to <laughs> I tried to learn, um, and I was raised by TV basically, so. So I tried to learn the American vernacular, and uh, and you know, t to this day, like people assume that I was sort of born and raised here, and that or I've, that I've attended university here. Um, but but I think um, I think you know, with with the U.S. being such a global powerhouse, um, and the kind of like image that we have, you know, being born and raised in other countries of the U.S. Um, I think you know we we sort of um, think of the U.S. as kind of it, it, and not only is it the global powerhouse, it's the cultural powerhouse. At the end of the day, like um, everybody in the world, everybody's eating cheeseburgers, right? So, um, so I think um, so I think for me, I mean, I, I I I personally like it as an identity. I do believe that America has given me a permanent home. That is, I think, you know, uh, key for uh, that. That is key because at the end of the day, for me to go back to uh, to go back to the UAE or to go back to any of the Gulf countries or to see my parents, I need a visa every time I go back, you know? And, um, and so the, just the idea of this permanent home, I'll, I'll tell you, like, when I was, um, uh, for the first time when I uh, entered back into San Francisco um, from, an international, from an international trip recently, um, that was the first time that I was coming in with a green card. And, and so at the border, um, the, the, uh, um, it was a very emotional moment for me because at first thing, I stood in the green card line instead of the visitor line. Mm -hmm. That was, that was one. And two, uh, when they stamped my passport, they said, welcome home. So, so. <laughs> Thank you. Very emotional stories.